pass the advertising at them and I know this for a fact I've got three daughters and one of them was hooked in cigarettes uh, you know in her, in her teens thank God she's off them now but again you know you get the teenager um, at that age and you've got them for life you get them hooked on this on the cigarettes and uh, it's the same principle that's at play and they've got millions of dollars to play around with um, and because of that the advertising that Ma talked about a few moments ago about the rockets and so on. Um, let me just talk for a moment about the cost and you can start to begin to see why it is the bottled water companies are in this business and why they're making so much money. We had a, uh, an engineer in the city of London come forward that deals with the water treatment plant and they said that they can basically process clean drinking water, pristine clean, to your tap for one-eighth of one cent per litre. Right? So, in London, we had a woman make a presentation to the city council. And you know, the industry likes to tell you that if you drink, you need to drink eight glasses of water a day. Um, I guess both Maud and I think that's, that's, that's bunk. Um, that in fact, you don't have to drink eight waters a day, but leaving that aside, let's assume for a moment you do. Um, eight, water, eight glasses of water a day times 365 days a year. This woman that made the presentation in London calculates that using municipal tap water, that would cost you the princely sum of a dollar eighty-eight for an entire year's supply using municipal tap water. Take the same amount of water coming out of that vending machine at a dollar fifty a pop. It's going to cost you two thousand one hundred and ninety dollars for the same amount of water. Now you can begin to see the profits that these folks are making. Now if that's not bad enough at a dollar fifty a pop, listen to this story. Maud and I were in a, in a hotel down in, I know that sounds terrible, but <laughs> <laughs> we were in several rooms down in Windsor. And, and uh, in the hotel room, there's these bottles uh, of water sitting on the counter. And a little sign next to the bottle says, brought to you for your convenience, um, a small fee of $8 will be charged to your hotel bill, plus taxes and really fine print. So I picked it up and I took a look at this bottle. I said, my God, this, gotta be, this has got to be, in Ireland we call it Ishkebaha. That's the water of life. Um, it's actually potchy and it's like, it's not, it's not rich water, right? Uh, so it's got to be at least potchy and for that kind of price, but it's not. It turns out um, this is uh, water, that, a bottle first off that came from uh, Norway. The water uh, in it, we don't know where it came from, possibly Canada, because we did hear stories from uh, a sister down in the Guelph she had been uh, in Florida and had come across massive displays of Aberfoyle uh, water, uh, water drawn from the wells in Aberfoyle. Um, so who knows where the water came from. But this came all the way from Norway, sexy looking glass bottle, heavy glass bottle. The bottle was probably made in China. The water probably came from Canada and it was packaged in, uh, in Norway. So imagine the, environment, the environmental footprint that this bottle alone would have left. Uh, Did you buy this? No, I actually stole it. <laughs> that's, that's another venial sin. <laughs> I liberated it, yes, yeah. But I'll, I'll tell that in confession the next time I go. Um, so anyways, uh, so you can start to see the, the massive profits that's, that's involved in, in this water, uh, in the bottling of this in the industry. Um, in the university sector, again, uh, the same approach has been taking place in Queen's University, we came across this wonderful group of, uh, of students, environmentalists, who had formed their own organization called Strive. And their whole job was basically to do an audit of the entire campus and take a look at how many drinking water fountains were actually operable and, um, and then go and of course and mount a campaign um, for the university to repair all of the ones. 58% of them were in use and 42% were not. Interestingly enough, outside of the hall where we are giving the presentation, um, there were two drinking water fountains and both of them were out of order. And both of them had little signs on them saying, you know, please uh, don't use the drinking water fountain out of order, the plumber. And I thought, oh my God, Joe the plumber is chasing mud barrel around now. <laughs> but anyways, um, the point is though, again, in the university sector, they were showing photographs of the drinking water fountains um, where they had placed a vending machine right in front of the drinking water fountain and then they'd gotten a broken down old chair and jammed the chair in behind uh, the water fountain and the, and the vending machine so even if you wanted to get the vending machine or sorry the drinking water fountain you couldn't get there so clearly um, the whole idea again in the university sector is they signed these exclusive contracts 
with Dasani or with Coke or with Nestle. Uh, oh, by the way, Nestle follows around, follows us everywhere we go. Uh, every time we, we make a presentation, the next day there's a letter to the editor. So somebody out there is from Nestle. Hi, from Maud and myself. <laughs> um, just, just so you'll know. Um, but, yeah, back to the university for a moment. Um, so what they ended up doing was uh, they signed these ex exclusive contracts with the university. Um, you can see the kinds of profits involved. So naturally enough, the university is getting a rapid return um, for putting in the vending machines and allowing the, the drinking water fountains to be rendered inoperable. Now, the only pitch I make here in this campaign uh, that has anything to do outside of water is for university tuition. Um, I just can't for the life of me, and I'm one of these folks uh, that believes in free university. I come from a country that gave free university to uh, its students, and I just can't understand why our universities um, are signing these contracts with these private sector corporations to sell bottled water in our universities and, and instead of lobbying governments and putting on the fight, look at the fight we had in York University uh, about underfunding of the university system. That's the kind of fights we need to be taking on, that's the kind of fights politicians ought to be taking on and I'd love to see the presidents of those universities joining in with QP to take on Queen's Park and say let's put more money into the university system instead of signing these exclusive contracts with the private sector. That's the only pitch I'm going to make. But the last point I do want to make is I want to come back to what Joanne Webb um, basically talked to us about because we, we're here on the, on the Mississauga territories, if you will. And all across this country there are 200 Aboriginal communities that are on permanent bile water orders. Uh, I can't understand why that's happening in the richest country in the world. I don't understand why up in northern Ontario we have a community, not just once, but twice in the recent past, their water treatment plant has broken down. And rather than fix that water treatment plant, what did they do? They put the residents onto buses and they bus them into Sudbury or they bus them into other communities. Could you imagine if the water treatment plant in Peterborough broke down? Could you imagine if they put them on buses and drove them into Oshawa? Could you imagine the outcry that would take place? And it's happened twice in northern Ontario. So clearly, you know, when we're talking about clean, pristine drinking water, and we're talking about a federal government that's putting investments right now into infrastructure, and only a pittance are they putting into water treatment plants, by the way. They're talking about 1.1 billion for the entire country. We have got to make absolutely certain we start putting the pressure on that the number one priority in this country has got to be every single Aboriginal community in this country ought to have access to clean drinking water. Far enough. Every single one of them. So, Anyway, so I'm just going to wrap up right now because there's a, you know, we want to hand it over to you to, to hear what you have to say because, quite frankly, this is the part of the evening that we enjoy the most. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass you back to, uh, to Paula and she will maybe ask those two sisters, or one of them at least, to make the way up to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sid Ryan, QP Ontario, another champion for public services, public water. Here come the two sisters up from uh,